point out that I think you're all slightly retarded. <laughs> Reason for that? You are 200 metres from a beach. It is sunny and warm and nice, and we never see this in Britain. And rather than sitting on the beach with a beer, looking at the half-naked people who are very pretty to look at, you've come and sat in a room to listen to a long-haired idiot talking about computers. You're not very clever. Leave. Go to the beach. It will make it easier for me because I can leave and go to the fucking beach. So, as nobody's left, which again proves that you're moderately retarded. Um, welcome to my talk, when I grew up I wanted to be a cyber terrorist. As you can see, this is a cyber terrorist. If you can't see what it says underneath, it says potential. Not everyone gets to be an astronaut when they grow up, if they grow up. This was found on an Israeli military bulletin board, where they were talking about, you know, Palestinians. So this is what the Israelis think about the Palestinians. Lovely. So, who am I and why should you bother listening to me? Well, um, as you may have been able to determine by the weird accent, I'm not Portuguese. I'm from the UK. Um, I run my own company in the UK because I basically am not adult enough to work for anybody else. In fact, I was assured by my last boss that ringing up at 12 o'clock in the afternoon and saying I'm not coming in because I've got a hangover and I want to watch cartoons is not actually an official business reason. <laughs> so that's why I set up my own company, because I can now make it an official business reason. <laughs> right. Couple of warnings. Um, I would say don't video or photo this, but there's a VCR there, um, so that went well. And I'm also incredibly new. There will be no O-Day in this talk. I will drop no O-Day. There will be no, no, no new tools released. If you're expecting new tools or new O-Day, Go to the beach. <laughs> um, additionally, one final warning. I do have a tendency of speaking very quickly, so I apologise for that. It's how I speak. And I also tend to swear. Um, so if you're offended by my language, fuck off to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to begin with a couple of quotes. Um, first one from the Centre for Protection of National Infrastructure, which is a UK organisation which looks after our national infrastructure. Hackers want to get into your computer systems and use them for their own purposes. No shit! <laughs> Thanks for that! I'd never have known! Lord, everyone should be worried, not just Estonia. I think that's referring to the Estonian Georgian cyber war, but it could be, you know, just generally. Everyone should be worried at all times. And a final quote from the best best cinematic rendition and the most accurate cinematic rendition about cyber terrorism, Die Hard 4. <laughs> Jesus Christ, it's a fire sale! That was me acting, by the way. <laughs> so, what's this talk about? Well, I'm going to be talking about cyber terrorism. And I'm putting cyber in that because it's a retarded phrase. I'm going to be talking about some of the claims that have been made about it and why they're retarded. I'm going to be talking about why the media is retarded. Um, then I'm going to be talking about what you could potentially do if you're an attacker, you know, because I'm retarded. And um, then I'll maybe offer some solutions which don't involve going to the beach, maybe, possibly, perhaps. So, cyber terrorism means lots of things to lots of people. It's a nice little catchphrase. Um, concerns about disruptive network born attacks started when more games came out. Because everybody saw Matthew Broderick copping off with Ali Sheedy and thought, oh my god, teenage hackers are going to start nuclear war by typing in Joshua. <laughs> um, it got really bad up until 2000, but then the Millennium Bug happened and everybody forgot about it, uh, which was good. However, it went really insane after 9 11, because, you know, obviously flying planes into buildings is much the same as, you know, a DDoS. Um, it was first discussed as a term in 2002 in my, one of my favourite articles, Cyber Terrorism, Fact or Fiction? Mm, fiction, probably, but you know. Um, so it's got a history and a pedigree, shall we say. Yeah. The definition, according to Technolytics, and I have, I have a number of issues with Technolytics, um, is the premeditated use of disruptive activities or the threat thereof against computers and our networks with the intention to cause harm or further social, ideological, religious, political or similar objectives. Or to intimidate any person in furtherance of such objectives. Not only is that a mouthful, it's also wrong. It's incorrect. Now, there's a degree of history between me and the MD, or CEO of Technolytics, called Kevin Coleman. Um, but I'll talk about that in a bit more detail later on. 
But long story short, I think he's a bit of a cock. <laughs> so, um, Richard Clark, who was the ex-terrorism czar for both Bush and Clinton, <laughs> how ironic, um, has been rattling on for years about the, thing, the series of events he refers to as the Electronic Pearl Harbor. Now, a while ago, he came out and said that's got nothing to do with cyber terrorism. It's actually talking about a different sort of electronic Pearl Harbor, where, you know, the Japanese dropped tubers on Pearl Harbor or something. Um, he wrote a brilliant book called Cyber War, The Next Threat to National Security and What to Do About It, in which he states, and this is fucking hilarious, that China can basically disrupt the US and completely reduce it to ashes in about 15 minutes. So, you know, they can take out ATMs, they can make planes fall from the sky, they can drive ships into, like, the Statue of Liberty in 15 minutes. So not only do you get Chinese food really fucking quickly, but you also really fucking good at that. Now, Richard Clark and his electronic Pearl Harbor, not meaning cyber terrorism, or maybe, or we don't know, is a lie. In the US, they can't even decide what conventional terrorism is. The FBI defines it one way, the Department of State defines it another way. The military defines it another way. Nobody knows. Personally, I say it might have something, a terrorist act might have something to do with, you know, invading smaller countries in search of oil, but, you know, that's because I'm a dick. <laughs> but it's all semantics. Basically, if you believe the hype, the very bad people will do very bad things, and the sky will fall, and we're all doomed. Now, most of the claims, are insanely exaggerated at the moment. Uh, another problem I have with cyber terrorism is it does use the word cyber, which, if you do use it, makes you sound like a retard. You know, it's not 1994. The Lawnmower Man was not a good film. Stop calling things cyber, you retards. Stop it. Now, I'm going to define cyber terrorism as the use of technology to facilitate acts of a terrorist nature, which I know is nebulous, but it's a lot fucking easier to say than the technolytics one. So, Wikipedia, the most awesome resource in the world, and why I'm giving this talk, because I look shit up. This is the best article on Wikipedia, concerning information warfare, and I quote, <laughs> The examples and perspective in this article deal primarily with the United States. They do not represent a worldwide view. Awesome. <laughs> so that's relevant information, isn't it, Wikipedia? Now, I'm going to define cyber terrorism as part of what I, I'm calling the pyramid of information security annoyance. Um, Fox News, and Glenn Beck particularly, love cyber terrorists. Now, I don't want to disagree with Glenn Beck because it kind of is like kicking the disabled. And that's not cool. So, my pyramid of IS annoyance, which I stole freely from the man who's just come in the door, starts with vandalism. So you've got the likes of, you know, a norm and law sack, moves up to crime, then up to espionage, then up to terrorism, then up to war. So terrorism, by and large, is the last overt action before war. Now, war is done. And I personally want you to examine just what risks are actually posed by the evil hacksawing terrorists at yeah. Now, I'm from the UK, as I said earlier, and we have got more cameras than anywhere else in the world. And they watch you when you go to the toilet, and it's really exciting. <laughs> and they've also introduced lots of new laws, which are meant to combat terrorism. Now, you know, I wanted to examine the threat and see why I'm being watched, and why they've introduced all these wacky new laws. So, quick bit of history. Um, Good cartoon. We like that cartoon. It made me laugh. So, first time we gave the stripped down version of this talk, I was told it was dangerous and that people would get the wrong idea. The guy who told me that was David Litchfield, so, you know, I took it on board because David Litchfield can own my arse. <laughs> now, hopefully, you'll come to your own conclusions. I was also told by Dave, who I respect enormous, enormously, that the UK media has calmed down a lot with regards to cyber terrorism. So, let's see if they have. A couple here, uh, one from September 2001. There was a fund that was declared for the amount of £650 million pounds for GCHQ to combat cyber terrorism. £650 million pounds is quite a lot of money. It's more than the UK has. It's definitely more than Portugal has. <laughs> now, there was another one that came out in August of, uh, of 2011. 
in which there was an article published in The Guardian in the UK, which is a UK newspaper, saying that there was a Chinese TV programme showing an apparent cyber attack on, attack on US infrastructure. So not only can the Chinese deliver your takeaway really fucking quickly, and hatch it really fucking quickly, they're also fucking showing off. <laughs> this one is good. This is from MI5, or the MD, the Director General of uh, MI5. So far, established terrorist groups have not posed a significant threat in this media, e.g. cyber terrorism. But they, are, but they are aware of the potential to use cyber vulnerabilities to attack critical infrastructure, and I'd expect them to gain more capability to do so in the future. Yes, because, you know, better sport gets better every day. And it's also a fairly telling statement, in as much that everybody in the UK is freaking out about the Olympics, which I don't really understand because, you know, they've got a McDonald's, everything will be fine. But anyway, it looks like the situation has really calmed down. So, I want to actually label this point, but the media does report terrorism. That's why terrorists are terrorists. You see, I've got this theory about terrorists. I think they're effectively like a rogue public relations company. You know how a public relations company creates a media event, and it gets coverage, and they sell whatever they're selling? Same with terrorists. That's what they do. They blow shit up, the media films it. You know, they can further jihad or whatever they're doing. Now, ranting about planes falling from the sky, which I'm going to do later on, because, you know, unlike everybody else, I like the bands falling, um, doesn't allow for defined risk. And if we're going to have a defined risk ratio with regards to terrorism, we need to calm shit down in terms of the language that's used. So, another quote, who controls the past controls the future, who controls the present controls the past. Everybody's favourite dystopian sci-fi author, George Orwell, and the president of Pertament. So, 98, first reported acts of overt political cyber terror. You could argue, you know, the likes of Hagbard and the East Germans were doing that shit, but that wasn't politically motivated. That was Germans paying for coke. Difference. Um, 98, what happened? A group called the Internet Black Tigers, who have perhaps the best name ever, <laughs> uh, basically um, transmitted 800 emails a day for all of fuck two weeks to various Sri Lankan embassies around the globe. Now, their plan, and it was cunning, was by sending 800 emails a day, they were going to disrupt communications. Now, in 98, even fucking Pegasus Mail could cope with 800 emails. So, you know. Bit of a bad fucking plan, that. But they are cited as the first cyber terrorists. Because, you know, they had an awesome fucking name and they used a computer. <laughs> the problem is, for, for in terms of terrorists, terrorists have to have an effect. That's kind of the job. Um, but, you know, in regards to the Internet Black Tigers, apart from their awesome name, the problem is that spammers were better terrorists than terrorists. Which is pretty fucking awesome. So, now yeah, you had the Black Hand in Serbia versus NATO. Um, you know, Black Hand Serbians versus NATO. Um, NATO servers got munched up with email. Um, there was apparently some data exfiltration from UK boxes. There were lots of viruses and bombs flying around. Personally, I'd be more fucking worried about the bombs. Because, you know, when they go off, I die. When the virus goes off, I get pissed off and reinstall. <laughs> also in 98, we have news of moonlight maze. Now, according to the reports, US military computers are being tar targeted by Russian hacksaws. Yes, I am talking to you two at the back. <laughs> uh, in 99, um, the US Deputy Secretary of Defense claimed publicly that the US were in the middle of a cyber war. In the middle of a cyber war. So far, there's been no, no public record as to who won. So maybe they're still in it. And maybe they won, or maybe they lost, which is why they didn't speak about it again. Um, 05, you have news of Titan rain. Um, like the Russians before them, the Chinese were having a go at US military systems. You know, the Chinese and the Russians. So it's all been a bit fucking red at dawn at this point. You know? You've got Chinese, Russians, Cubans, basically anybody who's a fucking communist. You also have the first use of the term APT, or as I call it, absolutely pathetic tripe, which is largely a marketing term that's used to sell shit. Because absolute, um, APT, Advanced Persistent Threat, means that people are doing their fucking job right. You know, that's what it means. Um, in 2009, the Chinese didn't get enough in 05, and they came back for Operation Aurora. 
Now, according to McAfee, we are all as a result fucking doomed. But it's really fucking weird, and it's really coincidental that all of these major attacks by rogue states happened at around the same sort of time of the RSA. So at the same time where everybody's in a room trying to sell shit, there's like really scary shit happening, which means people have to buy shit. Weird. <laughs> Bit of an aside here, and you'll have to bear with me, but it is fucking funny. In 2008, uh, US 304 Mobile Infantry got bored of doing army shit, like blowing people up and driving tanks around, and decided what they were going to do, rather than, you know, doing army shit, was to look at the threats posed by Twitter. <laughs> hey, we can drive a cat tank, or we can look at fucking Twitter. Twitter's probably safer. So basically what they wanted to do is they wanted to see how terrorist groups, e.g. Al-Qaeda-like, <laughs> they're a bit like Al-Qaeda, I mean they're brown and they're barely Mohammed, so you know, kind of same kind of thing. Uh, they wanted to see how they use telephones, same way as a fucker else, and how they used social media, or could use social media. The findings are all over the place, you can find them, and it's got lots of open source intelligence shit in there, but you know, it's fairly speculative. Now, basically what they found is that you could get pro-terrorist interfaces for your phone. So you could get, like, wallpaper. And weirdly, you could use a modern phone to use GPS. Who fucking knew? Um, you could also get scary voice over IP voice changes. Really terrifying stuff. Now, what they wanted to do was examine how, how Twitter could be used by adversaries. And I quote, and this is my favourite fucking quote from the military, Twitter has become a social activism tool for socialists, human rights groups, communists, vegetarians, <laughs> anarchists, religious communities, atheists, religious communities and atheists don't get on so much, but yeah, political enthusiasts, hacktivists, and others to communicate with each other and to send messages to a broader audience. That's fucking awesome! <laughs> As a vegetarian anarchist, I am perceived as a threat by the US Green Reform <laughs> Mobile Infantry for using Twitter. How fucking awesome is that? <laughs> right, basically, uh, their assertion was that social media could be used as a tool you know, to conduct research on potential targets. It could, but you know, so could carrier pigeons, so could divination, so could a fucking Ouija bot. Now, Twitter, as we all know, has already, you know, been involved with various subpoena battles. In fact, they've just published what information they've given to law enforcement over the last couple of years. Now, the issue is, if I'm a terrorist and I want to destroy the US, am I really going to use a company in the US to plot attacks against the US? Especially when I know that the US company is sharing information with the US government. Only if I'm a really fucking dumb terrorist. <laughs> now, obviously people do use Twitter for um, raising propaganda, you know. I'm on it all the time saying, buy my shit, I'm really good, I am, honest. But you know, that's not terrorism, that's publicity. Now, it seems likely to me that as opposed to Twitter, you know, terrorist groups are using closed forums. Um, can you use Twitter for open source intelligence gathering? Of course you can. Um, but, you know, you can also, you know, send coded messages to each other using Stego or post them on blog pages and, you know, do shit like this on the terror terrorism news site. Is there a terrorist on the bed? I do this all the time. This is my new hobby. Just disrupting people on the internet because I find it fucking funny. <laughs> so, is social media, which is another retarded phrase like cyber terrorism, a threat? Yeah, of course it is. If you post details of your troop movements on Twitter, then yes, that's a threat. But I can't see anybody being retarded enough to post details of their troop movements on Twitter. They do post other things, which we'll get into later. The question is, did the US 304 Mobile Infantry want access to Twitter in 2008 because all their friends had it? Yes. Next year, they're doing fucking Facebook. <laughs> you can't access social media, but it's a threat. We have to. Yeah, it's great. It's marvelous. Uh, organizational packing. Now, I'm not trying to dwell on state attacks. Uh, that's been covered off tomorrow. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about it. But I will talk about North Korea, because this shit's funny. Apparently, in South Korea, there is an Uber League group called Unit 121, which consists of about 19,000 hacksaw types. And they all live in this building, apparently. All 19,000 of them. 
I know buildings are really fucking small, but how do you get 19,000 of them in a building? I don't know. <laughs> uh, this first came out because a guy called Major Steve Sin um, saw an interview with an anonymous defector in the Yon Hat News Agency. Yon Hat News Agency, for those of you who don't know it, is basically the state-sponsored um, version of the Korean BBC. So lots and lots of heavy propaganda. You know, because the um, South Koreans, you know, are relying on US funding, and what a better way to secure US funding than say the evil communist city which the Korean Yetis. Now, let's talk a bit about Major Steve Sin. There is a guy who works for the US Army called Major Sin, and he's not aware of the fucking irony of his name. Now, personally, I think that Major Sin belongs in a low rent porn movie. You know? <laughs> Madame Cruella meets Major Sin. I can see that one. Now, the thing is, if the North Koreans haven't got cyber terrorists, which I don't think they have, because, you know, I called them on this bullshit and said, where's your source? And they said, we haven't got one. Uh, although what they did say, and this is fucking awesome, this guy, Kevin Coleman, is an, in, is an intelligence expert. He's testified to the US Congress about five times on cyber terrorism and various other bits and pieces. When I contacted him about this, he was like, what you need to do, you need to talk to MI5. Right, minor problem with that, Mr. Intelligence Expert, is that MI5 handled domestic surveillance. What you meant to say, you fucking cretin, was MI6. So, you know, US Intelligence Expert doesn't know what intelligence agencies do, so, you know. My point is that, if North Korea hasn't got super hackers, how come fucking Al-Qaeda has? North Korea's got more fucking money! So, that's better now. Sorry, I've got rid of the boring shit. What I wanted to do was determine what an individual attack could do. What sort of information is out there? What could a well-motivated and financed group do, you know, as opposed to a retard with too much time on his hands? Now, I'm going to talk about anything illegal. Yeah. Um, have I done anything illegal to get this information? Nope. Fuck officer. Fuck off, officer. I did nothing. There is no fucking proof. Aha! So, what I did is I applied .mil ideas and utilised open source intelligence. In other words, I read the fucking internet. Um, incidentally, my favourite thing here, just because you pay for it doesn't mean it's bad. Never say that to a hooker, they don't like it. <laughs> Pisses them off. So, repeat slide, yay. Now, some of this is just me talking. Lots for two reasons. A, so nothing incriminating is written down. And be because, you know, I'm a lazy bastard that couldn't be asked doing slides. So apologies for that. So, money. Everybody likes money. We all like money. We're all holes and we all dance money. <laughs> so, UK is major role, or plays a major role in international finance. Or we used to, when, you know, we still had money and shit. Um, there are loads of crazy theories about terrorists turning off the ATM network. Before we begin, though, a while ago, we did a network assessment for a large payment processor. These guys handle about 30 million quid of business a year. And, you know, we got a test scope off them, and it said, they have 2,000 IP addresses. So we rocked up and did some network discovery, and there are 8,000 IP addresses. <laughs> uh, reason for that is because their first head of network management um, had a minor breakdown, and the replacement guy um, was off sick. So, you know. But this is a major fucking payment processor. They handle a lot of fucking business. They really should know how to use fucking ping. But apparently they didn't. Which is a good thing, because, you know, I got to inflate my quote by four. So, you know, I was happy. But, you know, this is a payment processor. They handle money. Money's good. Terrorists would like money. And they don't know what they fucking have. So, anyway. ATM networks in the UK are managed by the banks and a system called Link. Link Network, really fucking hard. It's air gaps, it's got paranoid settings, and it's basically a fucking pig to play with. Hence, really easy, really that much easier to go after the ATM itself. Everyone in here, I assume, is familiar with skimmers. Some of you will have built, built them. Those are skimmers. You can buy them. You can send a nice little Romanian chap 800 euros, and apparently you get this. Or, you know, you could buy a fascia off eBay and build your fucking own. And, you know, not get ripped off. <coughs> so, you can always go after the firmware. Several people have. One sat in the corner over there. Uh, Barnaby Jack basically reprogrammed the firmware. You know, lots of people have done it. Terrorists could do it, maybe. Um, if that's too hard for you, ATMs have all got management modes. Most have got the default threads still in them. Um, with time and the desire, you could probably find them all out. In the UK, lots of locations use Triton ATMs. They're usually found in corner stores, 
news agents, <laughs> bars, pubs, clubs, strip clubs. I was doing research, dear, that's what the receipt's for. <laughs> um, now, the manuals are easy to find. I mean, you can go to a tradition and get them. Um, most uh, manuals, or many manuals rather, come up on eBay sometime. Um, most of the threads will be the same because they're deployed in shops. And guess what? In a shop, the man running the shop is running the shop, not doing machine maintenance. Because if he was doing machine maintenance, he wouldn't have a fucking shop. That's how the default threads stay there. But why bother doing that? That's too hot. Well, these guys. Um, Alvaro Mugal and Tazuli. This guy, incidentally, did look like that when he went into police custody and wasn't beaten up. Honest. <laughs> <laughs> he actually looked like that. Honest, we didn't just beat him. <laughs> now, what they did is they set up an organisation called Al Qaeda in Northern Europe, which is a bit fucking stupid. Because, you know, if you want to attract the attention of the intelligence community, don't name yourself after fucking Al Qaeda. And don't give them a geographical location, you fucking retards. <laughs> now, what they did was they engaged in low level fraud. For those of you that don't know, the Three Stooges, as I shall refer to them, <laughs> uh, basically used no malware, so shit that was in McAfee, uh, to key on Windows PCs. They then used those PCs on gaming sites to full, full out the money, and then they used the cash to buy tents and GPS and, you know, the big book of explosives for dummies. <laughs> and where did they buy them from? Amazon! <laughs> this is awesome! Terrorists are using Amazon to buy GPS GPSs and the big book of bombs. <laughs> now you would have thought that would have triggered some shit. And, you know, the intelligence community might have gone, shit, people are buying tents and GPS and the big book of bombs. And it's gone to Al Qaeda in Northern, in Northern Europe, Unit 4, 92, 92, some street. You know, maybe we'll investigate. Uh, were they caught because of sophisticated surveillance? No, they were caught because a Swedish Bosnian terrorist, let's play it back, Swedish Bosnian terrorist, is that like the world's most fucking unlikely mix ever? Um, he got caught and he had one of their cell phone numbers in his phone. And that's how they got caught. Now, quick aside, UK banks are corrupt. All banks are corrupt, but UK banks are especially corrupt. <laughs> if you're a merchant and you get your shit ripped off, um, they, as a merchant, you contact the acquiring bank. Now, some banks will confirm details that the fraud has happened. Some, and it's largely the US ones, won't, because they'll cite the personal data protection of their customers, even to the fucking merchant that's been ripped off. Now, if they work as a payment provider and an acquirer as a bank, They'll usually play ball with the merchant, sometimes. Now, why is that, why is that important? And why do acquiring banks do this? Well, they're banks, and therefore they're evil, and therefore they're dicks. Now, the nice thing about this particular scam is if you don't admit fraud to the merchant, the end cardholder, e.g. the poor bastard that's had their card details ripped off, has to prove the fraud happened. So basically, the merchant loses money, the cardholder loses money, but the bank don't. It's great. Now, the system of fraud reporting, because of that, is broken, fundamentally. And I would argue it's much easier to exploit than skimming or Trojans or crashing a stock exchange. And I also won't tell you who the acquiring banks are in the UK, but they are US ones. Don't do research. So, another little tale, which is kind of relevant. Um, we got a gig from a larger retailer. And they said, we've been red teamed, we're really fucking secure. And I went, that's nice for you. And I looked at the network, and they were only really fucking secure, and that pissed me off. Um, so I went to their nearest retail store, which you know, was about five minutes from my house, because I'm a lazy man, and I don't like to walk. Um, I went downstairs, two floors on that floor, and in the basement, there weren't any cameras. And there was a door marked staff only. So I went through the door that was marked staff only, because, you know, I'm staff. And there was a warehouse, and at the back of the warehouse, there was an office. And I went into the office, because that door was unlocked too. And there was a cab. And um, it was a lockable cap. And I unlocked it, because you know, the key was in the lockable cap. <laughs> and then I put in a rogue AP, I went to the car park, and then I got into their tills and siphoned off credit card details. You know, because they'd been red teamed and they were secure. <laughs> Another little tip, which is completely irrelevant, but fucking funny, and shows we are in a bad way. Um, a little sec for those, those of you that don't know them. I've done a lot of stuff with C99 shop. You know, let's get some RFI, let's stick up the shelf. Hey, we're hackers. No, you're shit. Um, but because of that, I did some research on 
the, the spread of C99 shell in the UK in terms of an infection base. Found C99 shell on a huge retailer in the UK. Only a web retailer, they don't have any shops, but you know, they are big. And I phoned up and said, I'd like to speak to somebody in IT security, please. And they said, um, okay. And then I got transferred to Janice and Accounts and had a lovely chat. So I phoned back again and then said, I'd like to speak to somebody in IT security. Eventually, after about five or six phone calls, got to speak to their IT security manager. That's his job, IT security manager. I said, hello. I'm not saying anything, but because I'm a dick and I use Google, I found out that you've got C99 shell on your you know, website that sells shit, and this might be bad. His exact words, what's a web shell? <laughs> so this is a man that worked you know, for a web-based retailer, and the only web-based retailer, that doesn't know what a fucking web shell is. <laughs> this might be a bad thing. <laughs> so, if, you're, if you don't use Google, you can always go after a stock exchange. Great saw given at RSA by a guy called Blanchardy, called, you know, packing the trading floor. Problem with that is that most um, trades, or most trading frauds, are in-house. Because, you know, they use weird fucking protocols, like the Financial Information Exchange Protocol, which is a fucking mess. Um, you know, who here in this fucking room, and be honest, has heard of carbon trading before that incident went down? No fucker. Somebody had that because, you know, carbon traders got ripped off for 30 million quid. Uh, so, you know, what, there, there is lots of fraud that's financially um, trade related, but most of it's internal, because it has to be. So, if you're too poor to purchase credit card details, which you still can do, and you're too lazy to hack, there are other ways of doing this. Uh, you do a quick grab of pasting, or which I did before I came here, and I found 15,000 currencies in. Now, some of them are going to be fake, obviously. I can put in 16 digits. Hi. Some of them are going to be flagged. Some of them are going to have been reported. But some, and maybe it's only a tiny percentage, some will work. And you know, what better use of your terrorist intern than doing this shit? It's cheap. It's easy. No risk. You know, there you go. Valid card details. Um, now, most carders keep things simple. You know, you find a reliable vulnerability, scan for that vulnerability, exploit that vulnerability. You know, BNC off bypass on TCP, uh, TCP 5090, bish bash bosh, we're in. Now, PCI, DSS, gonna stop that. <laughs> Bollocks, is it? Because if you're a small retailer, you don't know what fucking PCI DSS is. And if you're a big retailer, you don't fucking care. Because if you're big enough, you'll buy a fucking bank. <laughs> now, Lots of people have used this sort of strategy, you know, most notably Max Vision, who made a lot of money before he got sent to jail. Now, it's simple, it's easy to anonymize. You only need to let you learn one fucking Metasploit command, and you know, it's effective. So, if that's too much hassle, you can go on Twitter and check need a debit card. And on the need a debit card, people post pictures of their new debit cards. <laughs> like that! <laughs> Humanity is fucking retarded! <laughs> I have proof! <laughs> I think that one's Portuguese. Enjoy! It's a gift! <laughs> I'm so generous. <laughs> so, if you were a terrorist and you wanted to cause chaos, how could you do it? You find a weak merchant using a gnome exploit. You obtain the card data. Then you only use the card data that's associated with non-helpful acquirers, so acquiring banks that don't admit that fraud's going down. And then you profit, and then you buy a fucking unicorn. It's awesome. <laughs> so, let's turn my attention to planes, because planes are funny. <laughs> now, air traffic control systems are fun. Air traffic control systems are designed to keep planes in the air. That's what they're there for. They're not designed to be secure. Uh, the guy, a guy called Wright Kunkel, presented some awesome, awesome findings in DEFCON 7D, basically they've got on a plane. So, I'm a pilot, let's go here. He also has an awesome name. Writer Kunkel does sound like some fucking Bavarian sitcom actor. <laughs> um, basically, when people, particularly the media, talk about terrorism, making planes fall from the sky is what makes the news. So I wanted to find out if I could make a plane fall from the sky, because then maybe I'd make news. So, air traffic control in the UK is controlled by national air traffic control services. Now, that was set up as a public-private partnership in 2000. What a public-private partnership, you ask? Well, that's where the government says, we can't be asked doing shit, you do it, and gives it to a private company. Uh, basically, there's four main operational centres, two in London, one in Scotland, up in Prestwick, 
uh, one in Manchester, and there's also NAT services at 15 airports. So, you know, people go, look, planes, shit, move that one there. Shit, that one there, move that one there. That's what they do. So, uh, breaks down like this. Her Majesty's government own 49%, and the rest is split against about seven airline groups, British Aviation Authority, and the staff. So basically what you've got is a huge fucking clusterfuck with about 12 organisations involved. It's great from an organisational perspective. LinkedIn, awesome. They'll give you passwords away. And basically, <laughs> what you can do with simple queries, or what I could do with simple queries, is find out who the information security manager was, uh, find out who their information security analysts were, find out who their flight plan managers were, and my favourite ones, the heads, of, the heads of safety, program management, and security. Yay! All named, all with emails you could, you know, send your customised spear phishing malware to. Um, without using Multiga or any social engineering, just using LinkedIn, you can build a detailed organisational chart for air traffic control systems. Uh, if you wanted to use a targeted attack against them, stage one is done. You now just have to make the malware, get set out, use it. Um, if you want to be a dick, they also use WordPress as a web publishing platform, which, as we all know, is very, very secure. So, what tech stack do they actually use apart from WordPress? Well, in March of 2010, they published some details about the electronic flight data system, uh, which manufactured by Frequentis and use now of press for air traffic control. Um, that runs on Wacom tablets and is used to track flight data. That's what the name electronic flight data is for. Um, well, why did the UK have it? Because it was used in Nigeria and it was cheap, so we bought it. Um, problem with it, though, is it um, doesn't fucking work because it was used in Nigeria. And, you know, we have more planes in Nigeria. So, great buy there, guys. So, uh, as of 2008, Nat signed up to the European Commission's Single European Sky Initiative, which is basically a nice way of saying, we're all going to look at the same main traffic control systems because this shit's complicated. Uses its own tech stack, lots of its Java. <laughs> um, if you wanted, as an attacker, to find out what tech spec they've got, go online, because it's published. And as I say, they use Java. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you have sufficient funding, or indeed state support, you could focus on hardware, e.g. the Wacom tablets, which are made in China. Which, as we all know, doesn't attack anything, ever. But they do make good food and get it there quick. <laughs> so, should you, listen to, should you wish to listen to air traffic control, which is very boring, you can do. Because, you know, all their shit's published on airscene.co.uk, all their bandwidths. Now, it's an offence under the Wireless Telegraphy Act, but if you're a terrorist, I don't think you give a fuck. <laughs> really don't think you care. Now, if you go down that path, you should be aware that um, you can sometimes pick up a system called Hathwick. What Hathwick is, is a random banding thing that was introduced by the US military. So basically, if you're talking to a US military plane, it bounces frequencies, which is a pain in the ass to monitor, but it's quite funny. Uh, because, you know, it just is. Now, listening is better, than, sorry, seeing rather, is better than listening. It's something I call the porn paradox. <laughs> now, a guy called Ryan Dewhurst last year found some airport camps. They were largely for domestic tiny little airports, like Oxford. But some of them you could control. So what I did is I pointed the Oxford camera to look at the field next door, because nature's more fun than planes. And last time I checked, it's still pointing at the field. So, yay! <laughs> now, <laughs> it's highly unlikely that the would be used by terrorists, but I would argue from a security perspective, it's probably not a great fucking idea to show active runways online. I would have thought. So, this is press for air traffic control. I said it. It's one of the main operational centres in Europe. Massive place. Looks fucking horrible to work in. Unless you get in that chair and just go up and down. <laughs> <laughs> that looks fun. The rest of it looks shit. But I would get that chair and just go wee. <laughs> but anyway, why am I showing you a picture of Presswick? Why am I doing this? Well, fun fact about Presswick. It controls more airspace than any other European air traffic control. It controls about 900,000, that's now a million flights a year. It controls all the transatlantic flights from the UK to the US. Uh, it's, well, let's say it's one of the main air traffic control centres that are used, and it fell over in 2009. Uh, basically, they bought, um, again, some shit that had been used in Nigeria and realised it didn't work, <laughs> and then nobody could go to America. Fascinating shit, I'm sure you'll agree. Well, kind of is. Um, there are now five of us in our office. 
So what we needed was a 48 port switch, because there are five of us. So I bought one off eBay because it's great, and I paid £20 for it, and it arrived and it was shiny. Now, what I found is that it had a Serco sticker on the back. Serco, if you don't know, are a UK organisation that are responsible for everything in the UK that the government doesn't want to do, which is pretty much everything. So they do prisons and hospitals and benefit systems and air traffic control. And uh, I'll say, had a Serco label on the back. Maybe it's coming from a prison. Let's have a look. So we did. And what did we find? Well, we found the full fucking config for Prestwick with air traffic control. Who were using Cisco Cisco as an account. And their main management account, and this was fucking cunning, was backdoor, backdoor. <laughs> oh my god, that's so neat. We also had full VLAN details. We also had details of all their upstream switches. We also had service details, they use SAP. <laughs> um, we also had full VTP trunk details, including the password, which I'm not telling you. We also had the SMP community strings, which, funnily enough, were fully reading right and named after aircraft. <laughs> Who thought that an air traffic control, air tra air tra air traffic control center was naming shit after aircraft? <laughs> we, yeah. But basically, what we had was enough details to buy our own switch, again from eBay probably, reconfigure it to be like that switch, go to Presswick, plug it in, and then have all their data. But we didn't do that because we're not that shitty. <laughs> <laughs> what we did do, though, is look at this, which is great. Um, my favourite error of a message ever. Uh, blah blah blah, it's an offence to look at this. Blah 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 blah, fuck off, fuck off, fuck off. This session has been logged by Serco PLC. That's how good Serco are. When their shit's on my network, they can still see it. <laughs> <laughs> That's how fucking awesome they are. <laughs> so, I was going to bring it with me, just to prove I'm not talking out of my ass. But, as well as managing prisons and the welfare state and forcing people who are disabled back to work, they also have a hand in the UK border agency and immigration. So I could have got it here, but I couldn't have got it back. And I probably would have got into trouble at the airport. Especially because when I first reported it to National Air Traffic Control, they said, uh, yeah, switch, is it? Okay, um, thanks. And I'm up. But then, what was weird, is my mobile went. And I never give my mobile number to anyone that I'm not trying to either sleep with or have business with. <laughs> uh, but my mobile went, and I picked it up and said, Oh, right, Ken, who's this? Can I sleep with you? Can, you, can I have money? <laughs> uh, which, you know, is kind of how I answer the phone most days. And it was just like, yeah, hi, I'm affiliated with Nats. It's like, okay, what do you mean you're affiliated? Um, do you work for Serco? No. Do you work for Nats? No. So how are you affiliated? <laughs> I am affiliated. Okay. <laughs> I understand you found a switch. What's on this switch? Who are you? I'm frightened. How do you have this number? Oh, it's GCHQ. Hello. <laughs> so yeah, fun phone call. Instant paranoia for about a week. I was hiding under the fucking bed. <laughs> so, what I did do though, because I'm a nice man, is I actually did leave some feedback for the seller. Then the great fast dispatch recommended to alternatives. <laughs> <laughs> what I also did was I also, I also got in the news because I'm fucking whore, that's why I'm here. And my favourite one is in the Scottish Sun. Top secret airport data sold on eBay. <laughs> and it gets better. They described a switch, and I shit you not, as a gizmo. <laughs> and it gets even fucking better. What they made me do is they made me fucking plug a monitor into the back of the switch and then put, try and pretend there was a keyboard attached to the switch. <laughs> and then they took a photo of the gizmo. <laughs> we had a hell of a time. <laughs> focus on data and voice networks. There's no focus on weird or older shit like X25. Yes. Now, those who don't know about X25, world's first packet switch data network. Um, 70s, used. 80s, used. 90s, used. Now, used. Nobody knows they're fucking using it, but it's there. <laughs> um, they're owned and operated by national telcos and private <laughs> operators, banks and shit. Now, it's a pain in the arse to connect to X25. It wasn't, but now it is. You need a lease line, you need a pad, 
you need a network user ID, um, you know, need an extra 25 gateway. It's horrible. It's really nasty. But why, why would you do it? If it's not easy, why do shit? Well, I mean, it's old. And it's really fucking cranky because it's old. And it doesn't play well, well with IPv4 or IPv6. It doesn't understand them. It's too old. So basically, its reaction to IDS and IPS and firewalls is to basically say, Get the fuck off my lawn, you damn kids! Because it's old and it's cranky. <laughs> now, if you can get a number by war dialing, you know, remember that, it's like war games and shit. <laughs> um, you can broke force the old mechanisms all day, all night, no fucking knows. Because you can't watch them, you can't monitor them. Um, fun stuff runs on X25, great stuff. The Vodafone SMS yeah. gateway runs on X25. <laughs> I can beat your SMS, ha 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 ha. Um, Orange runs on X25 in some parts of the world. Um, so what we've got is we've got a deprecated stack running in environments which aren't secure. It's kind of interesting. Another thing I found that runs on X25 is the Greek National Lottery. <laughs> this is why I'm moving to fucking Greece. Because I think, with this information, I can win the Greek National Lottery every week. <laughs> which, I'll grant you, if you win the Greek Lottery, is only about 40 euros. But if you win it every week, it'll add up. At some point, I'll have like 400 euros. And nobody will know. Because they won't get suspicious when the same guy comes down every day. So, five of the week, I say, five, one again, yay! Look, he's not alive! <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Yeah. If you want to talk about VEX25, ITU, International Telecom Union, publishes details on all DNIMs. Great. Basically, a DNIM plus a newer, which is at most 15 digits or thereabouts, and you're in. How do you find the newer? War dial fucker. Um, X25 addresses are reserved. They never change. Once they're there, they're there. They don't change. It's not like IPv6 where you've got all these billions of shit to do. No, we've just got one fucking thing which you're going to use forever. <laughs> so if you have a number, the number is yours. Forever! So what sort of stuff is still reserved in the UK? Well, we've got Vodafone, obviously. We've got Nomura, who managed the London Stock Exchange. <laughs> and we've also got Raycall Telecom. Raycall, for those of you who don't know, now became, became Talus. Talus, for those of you who don't know, make baby killing machines and all kinds of full <laughs> military shit. Back. Terrorists are going to spend the time world dialing and brute forcing X25. Russian fraudsters will do it. Hello, at the back. <laughs> um, you can also map closed countries like China and Iran. Um, that said, if that's too fucking hard, there are more low fi ma methods of disruption. Build your own fucking cell phone drama. Drive it around the city of London. Laugh as no bankers can use their phone and arrange hookers. <laughs> so, there's always fraud. You can find open void phones you just set up. Piece of piss. Dial your own premium phone back. Um, if you can uh, combine a little bit of knowledge and showdown, and some premium numbers, you can commit fraud, which means you can buy a lot of camping, camping equipment, which means you get to go outside a lot, unless you've got an arcade in Northern Europe, in which case you don't go outside ever again. Now, X25, uh, X25 is all very old and good, and if you want to ask, know about it, ask Ram. Ram's very clever on X25. Don't ask me, I know nothing, I'm a new. Which is why I'm talking about XSS. Simplest and most widespread of all web vulnerabilities. Um, it's indicative largely or often of deeper issues in the site's coding. And if I was a terrorist, which I'm not, but if I was, that's what started, because it's fucking funny, so I did. So, whoever these people are, they go across site scripting. Same with these people, and these people, and these people, and these people. And these people. You need to play with beef, come on. Yeah. And beer. <laughs> and these people. And these people. And these people. And these people. We're a fucking fan! Better than that. Better than that. These people. He <laughs> did <laughs> the Joint Chief of Fucking Staff for Portugal. So the other men in charge of the army and navy, otherwise known as the guy with the rifle and the guy with the boat, those people. So, what was the point of that? Well, not, but I thought it was fucking funny, especially the bank one, which made me laugh like a basket. So, apparently the threat of cyber war, as we'll be informed tomorrow, I'm sure, is looming, and we are all going to die in a fiery apocalypse. The UK is developing cyber weapons. May or may not be flame. I don't know. Now, um, they're doing that because obviously that's exploit far too difficult to use, as I said earlier. Now, rogue states and political groups are all coming to get us, apparently. 
question is, why? Now, are attacks against computer systems increasing? Yes, because we have more fucking computers. That's the point. Are physical attacks in non-Western countries increasing? Yeah. Put it this way. Between 2000 and 2010, there were 11 um, terrorist attacks or attempted terrorist attacks against airports in the US and the UK. In Pakistan, there were 87 physical attacks where shit blew up. So, le lesson here, do not fly to fucking Pakistan. It's dangerous. Now, do physical attacks just blowing shit up make excellent press? Of course it does, that's why people do it. Does it make excellent sales strategy? You know, the Chinese are coming, the Russians are coming, it's like Red Dawn and shit, but with computers. Yeah, of course. That's why you have a computer. Um, what can you do if you...